Hi, on this week's episode, Dr. Nate Freeman is sharing a message titled Return Policy. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Transforming Culture with the love and word of God. This is Authenticity. We're going to start in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 20 through 21. Now, in your Bible, all you have to do is turn all the way to the end of the end of the book. Now, now if you go onto the maps, you've gone a little bit too far, but it's it's the last scripture, the last two scriptures of the New Testament. And this is what, what it says. It says, He who is the faithful witness to all these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. Heavenly Father, I pray that that you would anoint these lips of clay to speak your word to your people. I pray this morning that whoever hears this word, Father, that they it would be that they would be challenged, Lord God, to not only hear it but to perform it in their lives, Father, to hear from you, to be sensitive to your Spirit and to walk in the way that you've caused us to walk in you. Lord, we, we praise you and we give you glory and honor in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my message this morning is called The Return Policy. Now, if you've ever went shopping and you bought something and you brought it home and you maybe it was defected or maybe it didn't fit the way you thought it was going to fit, most retailers, most stores or companies have a return policy. You know, if you're going to make a big purchase, you want to know, well, what is the return policy? And, and here this morning, what I want to talk about is not something that we are going to return, but I want to talk about the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I know there's a lot of things that have been out there in the, the news and books and you know, people are predicted, well, you know, it's going to be 2020, it's going to be 2012, it's going to happen on this day and that day, and everybody's talking about the end of the world. And I don't, I can't tell you that I know the day or the hour, because we're not supposed to know those things. But I can't tell you we know the seasons, and here's what I know for sure, that we're one day closer to Jesus coming back. And so if you would turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 13, verse 32 and 33. And once again, these are the words of, of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He said this, he says, However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows, and since you don't know, when that time will come, be what? It says, be on guard. Stay alert. We don't know that time. We don't know the hour, but we can know the season. And the best way I can describe this or make this analogy is this, this past year in 2020. And we wondered, you know, we knew there was going to, be a basketball season. We knew there was going to be a football season. I know that's sports, but I'm talking about real life things here. But I'm using this as an analogy. They, you didn't know when the start date was going to be. You didn't, they didn't know if they were going to start playing games in August or September or October. They didn't have the date. They didn't know the day or the hour, but they knew that there would be a season. So these players, they prepared their bodies. They continued to work out. They continued to strategize. They continued to prepare themselves. Now, the thing is, not every athlete did that. Not every team was prepared. Not everybody was ready for that start of the season. And you saw that maybe in their play. Maybe you saw that in their, but then as the season went along, they maybe improved. 
But the thing that I want to talk about this morning is not this is not about a football game, not about a basketball game, not about a sporting event, not about entertainment. I'm talking about the greatest thing that's ever going to happen in our lifetime will be the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. And, I, and I'm telling you, he's not coming back as a manger, as a baby in a manger. We just celebrated a couple months ago. We celebrate the birth of Christ. And here in a few more months, we're going to celebrate his, his death and resurrection. But I'm here to tell you that he's not coming back to hang on a tree again. And what I want you to know is that Jesus, though, for those of us that are in his kingdom, he's never left. God's never left those of us. Now, let me explain that. Because Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, we have this treasure and earthen vessels. We have this voice that tells us, hey, this is wrong. This is right. Go to the left. Go to the right. Do this and do that. But he has also given us his word. And this is what it says. How can we be vigilant? How can we be sober? How can we be ready if we're not in his word, how can we be ready if we're not in prayer and communion with the spirit of God himself, the Holy Spirit that is on the inside of us, that same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So we need to be in fellowship with God, but we also have to be in fellowship with his word. And we have to spend, spend the time See, we spend a lot of time doing a lot of things. And, and when you look at your day, when you break your day down, how much time are you spending with God? How much time are you seeking his face? How much time are you seeking his ways? Are you consulting with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Or are you just giving knee-jerk reactions to things? See, God wants us to be ready. This is what he said. He's coming back. He's made the announcement. He made the announcement before he left the earth. I'm coming back. And now we know that the revelation that John had was one, was one revelation. It was not the revelations of John. It wasn't a series of revelations. It was a revelation. And this is what he told him. He said, I am coming back. And he told them while he was alive on the earth, hey, be ready in that day. I, I, I can't, me as man does not even know the day or the hour. Only my father knows. Only the king, the king. And, we, and once again, we're on this principle that we are in a kingdom where God's word is the decree. God's word is the law. And there's so many times that we get caught up in this world, in this world system. And we try so hard to be like everybody else. We try so hard to be like this person or that person. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with emulating our heroes or the people that, that mean something to us. But I want to remind you what the Apostle Paul said. He said, follow me as I follow who? Christ Jesus. But here's the thing that gets you into trouble is, is usually, see, it wasn't all the spies that thought that they could go in and take the land. It was only two of them. And see, a lot of times that's what happens. We want to we say what everybody's saying. But sometimes it takes somebody to listen to the voice of God that's willing to stand up to what God is saying to them. And though it may be different than what everybody else is saying, they're saying it because it's what God is speaking directly to them to do. God didn't tell everybody to build an ark. But we know that Noah heard. We know that Noah was obedient. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Now, these are some of the return policies that, that, that these are God's return policies. So the first policy is what? Be ready. Be sober. Be vigilant. You have to be ready. 
in season, out of season, you can't find yourself on the opposite side of God. But the second policy comes to us out of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. It says this, it says, to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. So Jesus is coming back for a church without a blemish, without, without a wrinkle, without fault, a holy, a holy nation, a holy people. Some of you right now are already, the devil's working on your mind and telling you why you aren't, you don't belong in that nation. But I want to remind you this morning, if you bowed your knee to the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if you have accepted him into your heart, if you, if you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, and if you allow his word to be your measuring stick, then I, I promise you, the Bible promises us what? Heaven. But we don't have to wait to heaven to get there to experience his power and his manifested glory. Yes, we have to contend for our faith here on this earth. We have to contend with this flesh suit. And so many times people say, well, you know, that we, we look and we're, we're judging. But I want to remind you also, he said, you know, do not worry about the speck in your brother's eye when you have a, a, a board, a log a forest, if you would, coming out of your own. And if we spent more time trying to become better people and then in turn treating others the way that we would want to be treated, then the world would be a better place. Then people would be running to you to know who Jesus is. Who's this thing that makes you smile every day, even though the world is in turmoil? Where did you get your peace from? How do you make it where you're at? But so many times we, we, we as Christians, we allow the chatter of the world to get into our, into our soul gates because we're watching the news. I don't care if it's CNN, ABC, CBS, uh, Fox News, Newsmax. We, we, we get all consumed with chatter. And if it's not chatter on news, it's the, the news of social media with self-reporters on there telling you this, that, or the other. And we get caught up with all these things and these thoughts but see, here's why I want you to know that God, he said, my sheep, my people will know my voice. And when you have, when that peace comes, when you're like, I know this is God, then nothing, nothing Things will try to come against you. Things will try to pull you away. Things will try, the lust of this world will try to get you trapped and ensnared. But you'll know when that peace comes from here. Because you'll know his voice. You know when you read his word. You know when you're walking in the things that you need to walk in. But see, there's so many times See, we know what God is going to do, but we don't have control over what people are going to do because God gives them a free will. But you do have control over what you do. You have control over what you allow into your ear gates and what you put in front of your face and what you allow to come out of your mouth. But see, here's the thing, that if we allow our hearts if we allow our hearts to be a blank slate, that we allow God to take the flame of his finger and engraft his word on his heart, then I don't have to tell you to 
speak or walk in faith, you are convinced of it. Now, as a minister, as a pastor, as part of the fivefold ministry, it's my job to, per, to perfect the saints to do what? The work of the ministry. And of course, we know that the work of the ministry, according to Timothy, is what? To do the work of an evangelist. If you like the show, then you might consider supporting us on either Cash App or Venmo, or you can visit the worldimpactnetwork.com slash become a partner to support us. So if we're not winning souls to, to, to Jesus, if we're not bringing people to Christ, if we're not, if we are not actively going after people to let them know, then how can we say that we are citizens of the kingdom of God? Because everything that, that he points to, points to that's the reason that we're still here on this earth. Now, he does it through miracles. He does it through signs and wonders. He does it through the way we conduct our life. And this is why when we walk on this earth, we're a king's kid. And as a, and, and as a child of the most high God, there is a difference. But our, but our Christianity is not measured by material things. Our Christianity is not measured by those things. Our, our Christianity is measured by our obedience to his word. And we, when we walk in his word, and we walk according to what he, what he instructs us to do, this is why they were called Christians. They walked in the anointing of they walked in the same anointing that Jesus walked in the earth. And this is why I said Jesus is still here because we are his ambassadors here on this earth to establish his kingdom. And that's why he said, hey, I'm tag teaming you because you as a collective group, you as the church, you as my people can reach the, the, the world for the kingdom. So he said, that's why I must go. And that's why I'm sending the com comforter. But I'm telling you, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Yes, Lord, quickly. It says they pray. Yes, Lord, quickly. Come back quickly. He's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. How do we get rid of the spots or the wrinkles? It tells us there in verse 26, in verse 5, it says what? To make her holy and clean. Washed by what? The cleansing of God's word. I know I make a lot of people upset because when, when we talk, because I base my decisions on God's word. And I also, in, in, in God's word, see, God gives us his written word, but then he gives us a word of topos, a word of dangerous opportunity for us individually, a purpose. This is what we said, the plans I have for you are not to hurt your harm, but to bless you and prosper you. Why? He said, before I knew you, I formed you in the belly of your mother's womb. I have a plan for you. A plan means that means a purpose for you. And people will try to tell you what that purpose is. People will try to convince you of different things, but you have to know that you know that you're hearing the voice of God and you're doing things because there's only one reason to be alive. And that is to win people to Jesus. Yes, we'll accumulate wealth. Yes, we'll be debt free. Yes, we'll walk in divine health. Yes, we'll walk in these things. But, 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 but the bottom line is all those fleshly things, the material things mean nothing if we gain the whole world, but we lose our soul or people lose theirs. And this, is, this is, brings me to the, to the book of Matthew. Chapter number nine in verse 37 and 38. And he said to his disciples, you see, these words, these are, these are the words of Christ. These aren't Nate Freeman. I, I didn't come up with this. I didn't, I'm not making this up. 
these words were spoken to, spoken before the foundation of the world were, was slain, because it said that, that before the foundation of the world was set, that what Jesus was slain, that means Jesus who was, Jesus is the word, right? The, the, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word, Jesus, this word that he spoke was already there before we were even in existence. And so he, when that word was there before we were in existence and he, he was speaking that word before, we're just, we're just meeting that word in, present time, in our present time. But this present time that we're living in or, or is, is to our benefit. But God has always been and always will be. His word has been spoken. We are walking through the life that God intended us to, but unless we choose not to. This is why we don't have to worry if we're what? Walking in him. You don't have to be angry if you're walking in him. You don't have to be upset this morning if you're walking in him. You don't have to be controlled by anxiety if you're walking in him. Because he already, from the beginning of time, he already spoke this word. Because before the foundation was set, the word was slain. And when we get a concept of God's kingdom in this word that he has spoken... And we know that we're down the path and we may not see everything. We see, we're at A and we see Z. But sometimes we have to go through some things because there is, you do, we all have something in common besides the red blood that flows through our veins. And what we have in common is we all have an adversary and his name is Satan, the devil. And he pushes your buttons and he gets you upset and he gets you mad and he tries to pull on your flesh and he tries to get you to do things and lie, steep, chill, uh, still, and, and do all these things that you know you shouldn't do. And, and what's in the balance is our soul as our flesh fights against the very spirit of God that's on the inside of each one of us. Some of you will pray, you get all excited listening to this message. And as soon as you, as soon as you get off your computer, you're going to go to a porn site. Why? Because you're, you're, you're bound by that sin. But if you want to be set free this morning, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. If you what, know the truth, right? And then some of us need, that's why it's important to be in fellowship, right? Because those demons that are around, one puts a thousand of flight, but two puts 10,000. And this is why the world has been fighting the church so hard about coming together because he knows if we're separated, he can keep you in those dark places. He can keep you doing those things that are keeping you separated to not be vigilant, not to be ready, not to be, not to be geared up in your armor of God. And then you sit there as your mind, it, your mind as that battleground. And, you're, and, you're, and, and thoughts are coming in these things and you're battling in your mind. But see, there's a place where God has opened up the heavens and he allows his word to come through, and that brings the peace. And then, and then through that, that's where we come to know him. I want to close with this, with this statement. It says, it says in, verse, in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, it says, he said to his disciples, the harvest is great. But the workers are few. So pray to who? The Lord, who is in charge of all the harvest. Who's in charge of all the harvest? The Lord. Who are we praying to? The Lord. What are we praying? It says, ask him to send more workers into the fields. 
If you're witnessing the people, if you're telling them about Jesus, if you're inviting them to church, then you're one of the few. The few, the proud, the army of God. That's who he's coming back for. He's not coming back because you, you have the biggest bank account or the biggest house or that you gave the most money. He's coming, and all those things, I'm not saying are sin, I'm saying all those things. What does it, it, it the Bible's clear, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? But if we allow ourselves to let those things take control of us, those things aren't evil. We need money. We need people with large houses to hold Bible studies. We, we, we need people. Money's not evil. The lust for it is. And when that lust for the money is greater than your love for God, that's when we're in trouble. But he says to go to pray for the workers. We, won't have to, we don't have to beg God for souls. He said, go out there. And I'm closing with these two points, these two things. He said, he said, go into all the world and, and what? And make disciples of the nations. Make followers of Jesus Christ. That's, our, that's, our, that, that's what he last commanded us. We don't have, because, because we're king's kids, you know, if, if you, Prince, you know, over in England, they still have the, 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 the Queen of England and, and her family. You know, Prince Andrew and his brother, they don't have to beg the Queen for, for, a, for, the, for a house to live in. They don't have to beg the Queen for health care. They don't have to beg the queen for anything there. So why are we begging God for things? It, we have them. We just have to ask. We have to walk in the freedom of it. But in order to grow the kingdom, then people have to go out. People have to go out and bring people under bring people into the kingdom. And, and, and here's the thing. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, I want to give you opportunity to do that. Maybe you, you, you've allowed yourself to get far from God. Maybe you haven't been in church for, for some time. Maybe it's been, some of you, it's been two, three years. Maybe you went to church as a kid, but now God's been on your heart.